Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so yes, I'm Nick Benton. I'm a researcher here working in the Programming Principles and Tools group. I've been here since 1998, which is nearly when the lab started, not quite. Um, so yeah, so it all starts with coffee. So, uh, so the, the popular perception is that uh, mathematicians and computer programmers are both machines for turning coffee into strangely incomprehensible streams of symbols. Um, and uh, mathematicians produce as their output theorems, and computer programmers produce as their output executable code. And a priori, it seems as though these are two quite different sorts of stuff. So in particular, mathematics is about eternal verities. It's static. The truths of mathematics hold for all time. Whereas computer programs, they're much more active, they do things. Um, and the, there seems to be quite a, quite a difference between the, uh, between the philosophies of, of, of mathematics and computer science. And what I'm going to talk about today is about how really these two things are the same. They can both be reduced to logic and that that interaction between logic and computation is at the heart of some of the most uh, exciting philosophy uh, and, uh, and recent developments in computer science and mathematics. So, really, it all goes back to the Greeks. Um, the Greeks were the first people to um, formalize the notion of a proof as a sort of uh, uncontestable argument to your conclusion from a bunch of obviously true um, axioms. So that the simplest form of proof is the syllogism. Um, the syllogisms were first described by, I guess, well, first written down by Aristotle in about 350 BC. And uh, here we have an example of syllogistic reasoning. So it says, all babies are illogical. Nobody is despised who can manage a crocodile. And illogical persons are despised. And from these three statements, you can deduce, if you stop and think about it for a second or two, that no baby can manage a crocodile. Um, so the reason for this slightly fanciful uh, example, which is due to Lewis Carroll, um, is that the important thing about syllogistic reasoning that Aristotle spotted is that the shape of a valid argument doesn't depend on what the statements are actually about. There are rules for deducing true facts from assumed facts, which are invariant under what the actual facts are. So uh, this gentleman here is supposed to be, but probably doesn't look anything like, Euclid. Um, so he wrote a very famous book in 300 BC called The Elements, which contains um, what he knew of geometry and arithmetic and many other things. And in particular, uh, he introduced uh, generations of school children to the idea of doing formal proof in the area of geometry. So he started with a bunch of axioms, statements that, about geometry that he took as, um, as, as, as basic. And then from there, you could deduce all sorts of highly non-obvious facts about geometric figures. So here's an example of the sorts of thing that was in Euclid's element and was, was, was taught to all school children for 2,000 years, but probably no longer. Uh, this is Thales' theorem. The theorem says that if you have a, a triangle, all of whose vertices are on um, the circumference of a circle, and the hypotenuse of which is um, a diameter of the circle, then this angle up here is always a right angle. And this is far from obvious. And the way that Euclid explained that you could convince yourself that this absolutely had to be true um, is by constructing this new line here from O to B and observing that this triangle OAB is isosceles because this is a radius of the circle and this is a radius of the circle. Hence, this angle here, alpha, and this angle here, also alpha, must be the same. Likewise, this triangle OBC is also isosceles because that's a radius and that's a radius. So this angle here and this angle here must be the same beta. Now, he's already proved in an earlier proposition that the sum of the angles inside a triangle is 180. So if we now look what, what we've got as the angles of the triangle, we have 2 alpha plus 2 beta is 180. Therefore, this angle here, alpha plus beta, must be 90. Brilliant. Um, so many people um, have been enraptured, really, by the 
the mixture of ingenuity and inevitability in arguments like this. Um, and there's a, rather, there's a rather lovely sonnet from the 1920s written by somebody slightly overheated and young, I think, called Euclid Alone Has Looked on Beauty Bare. Um, and there's also a, a rather lovely account of Thomas Hobbes falling in love with geometry on discovering the elements in a, a gentleman's library. Um, so one of the things, I've, actually, I'll just point out right now about these axioms that's quite interesting is that, actually, if you read these things, they're a strange mixture of declarative statements about things that are true and procedural statements about things you can do statements. So, so, so this, this statement says that um, it's a declarative statement. I mean, I didn't read the whole thing, but it says if you have a straight line falling on two straight lines and the interior angles like this, then something is true, whereas these are operations which you're allowed to perform. So moving forward to the uh, 17th century, this is one of my absolute heroes. This is Gottfried Leibniz. Um, so he's probably best known around here for the priority dispute over the discovery of calculus with, um, with uh, Newton. But uh, he did many other things. He was a true polymath. He did philosophy, mathematics, logic, but he also did politics and law and all sorts of things. He's responsible for binary numbers. Um, he's responsible for uh, the mysterious word monad, which those of you who've come across Haskell will, uh, will know. Uh, and he's responsible for the very notion of a function, a mathematical function as being a, a, a relationship between inputs and outputs. So one of his particular input interests was mechanical computing. So this gadget down here is one of the earliest calculators. It's called the stepped reckoner. Um, and this could do the four basic arithmetic operations of addition, and subtraction, multiplication, and division. And uh, his construction of this was enough to get him elected to the Royal Society. But he, he had much grander ideas about what you could do with machines to, um, to formalize reasoning processes. So here's a, a statement. He had this vision that would, the only way to rectify our reasonings is to make them as tangible as those of the mathematicians so that we can find our error at a glance. And when there are disputes among persons, we can simply say, calculamus, that is, let us calculate, without further ado, to see who is right. So he had this clear idea that you could... Um, you could turn reasoning into something like calculation, and he knew that calculation was something that you could do on a machine. In fact, he had completely crazily ambitious ideas. He thought he could come up with a, what he called the Characteristica Universalis, which was a, a universal language in which all human thoughts could be expressed, made up out of words which corresponded to every indivisible notion, and that then there would be a, uh, a calculus ratiocinata, ratiocinator, uh, which was a system for deducing new true facts from, uh, in this language from, from ones that you already had by, by a purely mechanical process. So one of the things that, that Leibniz clearly understood was the relationship between logical reasoning and computation on numbers. And uh, this was something that was taken up in the uh, 19th century by George Boole. So his uh, um, investigations into the laws of thought from 1854 um, is the first place that it was really worked out how you could um, compute with the numbers 0 and 1 behaving like the logical notions of false and true. So this is an extract from his, uh, from his uh, 1854 book um, and this is the proof of what Aristotle called the principle of contradiction, um, we would call the law of the excluded middle, that something cannot be simultaneously true and false. Um, and it's, it's worth kind of seeing how this works. It's completely gorgeous. So he starts out with this, which he calls a law of thought. Um, and uh, the, uh, the way this works is zero is like false, and, and one is like true. And multiplication is like conjunction in logic, um, and disjunction is like addition modulo two and negation is like subtraction from 1. So he starts this law of thought, x squared equals x, which in its logical reading, reasoning means x and x is the same as x. Right? So knowing something twice is the same thing as knowing it once. So, so this he thinks of as obvious as a, as a, as a, as a, a law of, of, of thought, of logic. But he then manipulates this in an arithmetical way. So he subtracts x squared from both sides to get x minus x squared equals 0 and then factorizes this, taking the x's out, x times 1 minus x is equal to 0. So now under the logical interpretation, this says x and not x is false. Okay? So you, something can't be true and false at the same time. So everything which had been done 
uh, up to this point uh, was propositional logic. So there, was, there were a collection of statements, and they were true and false, and you could combine them with and and or and implies and so forth. Um, and the really big uh, step forward came with Frege uh, in his uh, Begriffsschrift from 1879. He first introduced formally the notion of logical quantifiers. So you could now make logical statements that were about sets of individuals. So this upside down A, for those who've not met it before, I imagine most people probably have, means for all. And this backwards E means there exists. So you could now say, for all things like this, there exists something like that, and so forth. He was also very keen on notation. Um, so he was the first person to introduce um, a nice notation for writing down proofs as, as objects. So this is his version of the law of modus ponens. Uh, so he introduced this notion of having a notation of having a, a horizontal line where you have assumptions on the top of the horizontal line and conclusions on the bottom of the horizontal line. And he introduced this turnstile symbol, as we call it, this chap, which means something is, is provable. And he had a rather nice notion for implication. So what this means in his notation is, if B implies A, and you know B, then you can deduce A. Um, and actually, this notation for implication, which we would write B arrow A, is rather lovely, because um, it looks not accidentally like a transistor. So the idea is B is switching A. Um, so, uh, so he introduced, he introduced quantifiers. He came up with a nice formalization of, uh, of first order logic. He wanted to go a bit further, um, and in his uh, uh, Grundgesetze of 1893 and 1903, he attempted to use logic to um, formalize all of arithmetic. So, uh, so he was a belief, uh, believer in logicism, the belief that mathematics could be reduced to logic. Um, so, uh, so he worked out this logical system which was powerful enough to prove things about the natural numbers. And... Um, uh, it was a wonderful achievement, but uh, just as he was going to press, um, he received a, an unfortunate letter, and as he had to kind of insert into, into the book at the last minute uh, a little statement along these lines, it's, hardly anything more unfortunate can befall a scientific writer than to have one of the foundations of his edifice shaken after the work is finished. This was the position I was placed in by a letter of Mr. Bertrand Russell, just when the printing of this volume was nearing its completion. So it turns out that formalizing mathematics in terms of logic is actually quite tricky to get right. So this is Bertrand Russell um, on the left here, um, who uh, not only was a, a great logician, but looked like a great logician. Um, and uh, the paradox that he discovered in Frege's logical system uh, is, uh, well, Frege's logical system allowed... Um, unrestricted comprehension. If you had a property of things, you could make the set of all things that satisfied that property. And Russell said, aha, uh -huh, what about this? Which, this is the notation for this in English. Consider the set of all sets which are not members of themselves. So the set of all x, such that x is not a member of x in modern notation. Well, you then ask yourself, is this set a member of itself? Well, if it is a member of itself, then the characteristic formula associated with that is says it's not a member of itself. And if it's not a member of itself, then it should be in this set. So the idea that whenever you had a property of things, you could form the collection of all things with that property was inherently paradoxical. Um, and uh, this was, the, this was a, a, a blow to, to Frege's system. Uh, but Russell didn't just um, point out the inconsistency in, in Frege's system. He also suggested a solution. And his solution was to introduce types. So the idea was that rather than just having a universe of stuff, sets, all of which uh, could be in this membership relation with, with, with one another or not, that well-formed statements ought to obey some kind of typing discipline. So very much like the types that we that we know in programming languages now. This is where the, this is where the idea was first, first introduced. So under Russell's system, uh, state, state, um, expressions like this would not be, would not be well formed. So you, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't talk about whether a set was uh, a member of itself. Sets could be members of other sets, but they, the types kept them apart in such a way that this was not even a well formed notion. So together with a collaborator, Alfred North Whitehead, um, Russell came, took his 
theory of types and attempted to construct um, uh, uh, as much of mathematics as he could in this very, very austere logical language. And uh, they wrote three volumes, um, about 100 years ago, 1910 and 1913, so uh, we're in the anniversary of the, of the last, um, last volume coming out. And uh, they, got, they got quite away um, in formalizing mathematics, but it's, um, it was uh, incredibly painful work. Uh, Russell said that uh, his, uh, his brain never quite recovered from the strain of writing Principia Mathematica. And indeed, I think he, he probably did um, not all that much logic after that. Um, but yes, he got as far as sets and cardinals and ordinals and the reals and so forth. There was another fix to Frege's system, uh, which is actually the one which is uh, uh, at least unofficially used by most practicing mathematicians these days. So that was to take the, a set theory due to Zermelo, uh, including an axiom of, called foundation, which, uh, uh, which like types, uh, uh, stratifies things so that sets are all built up in a cumulative hierarchy of universes, and statements like this would be, uh, uh, would be ill-formed. And that, uh, that foundation axiom is due to John von Neumann, who um, also worked on uh, early computers as well as, as well as logic. And we'll see that throughout, that the people who made contributions to early computers and the people who made contributions to, to logic were, were usually the same. So here's a, a famous extract from Principia Mathematica to give you some idea of, uh, uh, of, of what working in this system was like. I have a copy upstairs and there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of this stuff. Um, so this is, this is, this is famous because this is page 379 of the first volume um, and, uh, and we see this kind of strange mixture of formal symbol manipulation and then at the bottom the classic line that says from this proposition it will follow when arithmetical addition has been defined that 1 plus 1 equals 2 and the, the proof of that fact is completed on page 86 of volume 2. Um, so you can see that, that proving substantial statements in a system like Russell's is sort of possible, but incredibly painful. There's pages and pages of this, of this, this, this kind of um, uh, very fine syntactical manipulation required. <coughs> so the next, uh, the next character in the story is uh, David Hilbert. Uh, he's one of the, uh, one of the great figures of... Uh, I suppose, late 19th and early 20th century mathematics. Uh, he was a professor at uh, the University of Göttingen. And he's famous for many things. Um, at uh, 1899, he, um, he redid Euclid in a, uh, in a formal way. So rather than the kind of informal reasoning that the Greeks had done, he had a formal language like that used by Russell and Whitehead, and he axiomatized geometric concepts in symbols. He had 21 axioms, I think, for geometry, and he redid quite a lot of what was in Euclid in this very formal symbol-manipulating way. Um, he's famous for giving a speech at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 1900, in which he laid out a grand program of challenges for mathematics for the coming century, uh, which in fact had a, a huge uh, uh, influence on, on, on mathematics throughout the 20th century, and indeed some of the, some of the problems are still of interest today. Um, but around about this time, um, about 1920, there was, a, there was a feeling that there was a, a kind of crisis in the foundations of mathematics. So people had started to get more formal about things uh, and about what counted as a proof. And in particular, they found themselves troubled by not knowing what, what counted as a valid proof when you started talking about infinity. Um, so lots and lots of proofs involved different notions of infinity and it wasn't at all clear what, um, uh, what counted as a valid proof and everyone was feeling a bit shaky and uncertain because of the discovery of paradoxes when people tried to, tried to tie these things down. Uh, but he was a great believer that we could write a universally accepted collection of formal rules which would capture all of mathematics uh, and which would give us certainty back. And so he, he, he had a sort of call to arms in 1920. He said, the definitive clarification of the nature of the infinite has become necessary, not merely for the special interests of the individual sciences, but for the honor of human understanding itself. So he set in, he set in motion what, what's usually known as Hilbert's program. He wanted to reconstitute mathematics from the ground up, including treatments of infinities, in a completely formal logical system, which we could prove, using finite proofs, was consistent, 
In other words, it should be impossible to derive a contradiction, like 1 equals 2, or true equals false. It should be complete in that all true statements should be provable in this formal system. And furthermore, it should be decidable. There should be a finite terminating procedure for deciding whether or not any statement written down in this formal language was provable or not, which, because of completeness, means true or not. Okay? This is called the Entscheidungs problem. And Hilbert really believed that this could be done. Um, so he said, here is the problem. Seek its solution. You can find it by pure reason. For in mathematics, there is no ignorabimus. There, there is no such thing as we don't know, as I don't know. And here, the, a famous line, wir müssen wissen, wir werden wissen. We must know, we shall know, which is actually on his, uh, on his gravestone, I think. Um, unfortunately, a clever young Austrian called Kurt Gödel came along and showed that Hilbert's program, as he had laid it out, was actually unachievable. So he wrote a, a now very famous paper in 1931 called On Formally Undecidable Propositions of Principia Mathematica and Related Systems. So what Gödel did was he observed that the formal systems that you used to, uh, uh, to prove things were themselves subject to reasoning. Indeed, you could encode sequences of uh, um, uh, expressions in, in your formal language as natural numbers. And you could encode the inference rules of your formal system in terms of uh, facts about natural numbers so that statements about the system become statements about arithmetic. So if the system is powerful enough to prove interesting things about arithmetic, then it can always talk indirectly through this interpretation about itself. So he then observed that if you have such a system, you can construct a proposition P, which when you read, so it's a proposition P, on the face of it is just a statement about, uh, about arithmetic, about natural numbers. But under this interpretation of these natural numbers being talking about derivations in your formal system, the reading of what P means is P is not provable. So P says, I am not provable. Now, this has to be true. Because if P were false, then P would be provable. And if P is provable um, and says P is not provable, then you would have an inconsistency in your system. So if your system is consistent, it must be that P is true, i.e. that P is not provable. So you now have a true statement which is not provable. So this, I mean, and this is a completely generic argument. I mean, he constructed it for, 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 for uh, explained how it worked for a particular system, but this applies to any formal system that's consistent and strong enough to talk about arithmetic. You can always construct by one of these clever encodings, girdle numbering as it's known, um, a statement which is true but not provable. So completeness is completely unattainable. Um, Hilbert was said to be rather annoyed uh, when, he, uh, when he heard about this result. The next person to come along was Turing, who dealt the next blow to Hilbert's program. So if you recall, he wanted something which was consistent, complete, and we've seen that completeness is not attainable, but he also wanted something which was decidable, that there should be a, a, a finite procedure for telling whether any statement is provable or not. So if we give up completeness, it's still possible that we have a system that is powerful enough to prove not all true statements, but enough true statements. And then we would have this mechanical procedure. Again, you see this connection between computation, so this active thing, uh, and, and, and deduction, this static, um, uh, static mathematical view of things, that you could, you could still have a, a decision procedure, uh, uh, something which we would now think of as, a, as an algorithm, uh, for deciding whether things were provable or not. But what Turing did, by an argument very much like that used by Gödel, is show that in actual fact, the Entscheidung's problem, this decidability, was also unattainable. Um, so, uh, so what he did was he introduced the, the Turing machine and showed, um, as I guess Byron probably told you about an hour or two ago, um, the undecidability of the halting problem. So the Turing machine was a, uh, an idealized model of, well, a human, uh, a human being doing, doing computation. And he showed that uh, the question of whether a Turing machine halted was not decidable by an algorithm. And so his, his argument was a diagonal one um, involving uh, something applied to itself, much as, this, uh, much as this statement P talks about this statement P, 
um, here you have a machine which is fed, which is fed its own code um, uh, to make this to make this proof go through. So so he showed that uh, so so this was the the undecidability of the halting problem showed that the Schrodinger's problem was also uh, undecidable because um, you uh, if the machine halts then there will be a if you like some kind of finitary demonstration that it halts and so you don't this shows that it's not decidable whether or not there is is such a derivation. So. Uh, so Turing also worked on uh, on code breaking very famously. It's um, 100 years last year since his birth, uh, so there were lots of celebrations about uh, about that. Um, uh, he worked on he worked on code breaking, and he, he also worked on uh, a couple of of, of real uh, compu famous computers, the Ace and the Manchester Mark One. But one thing that's not so well known, I didn't know until a few years ago, was that in actual fact he also worked on formally proving the correctness of computer programs. So there's a, a paper which hardly ever gets cited back from 1949 called Checking a Large Routine, uh, which has this uh, probably to use slightly unreadable figure. But, uh, but basically what's, uh, what's here is he's got a, a flow chart for a program and he explains how you can convince yourself that this program is, is correct by writing down uh, logical statements about the values of all the variables that always hold when the program is at particular points in the flowchart. And that's an idea that um, we'll come back to uh, in a slide or two. So Turing did his uh, PhD at uh, Princeton under this chap, Alonzo Church. And uh, Church introduced a foundational model of computing which was slightly different um, from that of Turing. Um, he was actually looking for a foundation of logic, which was a more natural than the type theory of Russell or the set theory of, uh, of Zermelo. And so he took as his primitive notion, not sets, but functions. And he introduced this, which is called the lambda calculus. So uh, the lambda calculus is a, is a very simple language. So the grammar of terms is given here. It says terms M and N are either variables, X, or the application of one term to another term, or the abstraction of a variable in a term. So this is a, this is a variable that stands for something. This is thought of as a function applied to an argument. And if m is an expression with a, with a variable x in it somewhere, this is the function which takes an input x and produces whatever m is as the argument. And this collection of terms is, um, has a, well, there are a number of things, number of rules you can apply, but the most important one is this, which is called beta reduction. So this says lambda x dot m. This is the function which takes an x and gives you back m. When you apply that function to an argument, it reduces to the body of the function with the argument substituted for the variable. So this logical calculus um, turned out to be inconsistent as a logic. Uh, uh, Stephen Cleaney and uh, Berkeley Rotter uh, proved that his logic was actually inconsistent. It was subject to a paradox which was quite like the other paradoxes that, um, uh, that people had come up with. Um, but uh, the calculus itself is not inconsistent. Not all terms reduce to each other under this, um, under this um, relation. And um, this calculus is the foundation for modern functional programming languages like Haskell, ML, and F Sharp, and so forth. And there's a, there's a rather lovely quote from Church who was completely didn't have the idea of this thing being, uh, being a, a useful way of programming computers or anything, that there may indeed be uses for the system other than as a logic, which has been shown uh, very much right in the last few years. So this, this version of the Lambda Calculus is untyped. It doesn't have types on it. There is just one class of terms. But Church also came up with typed variants of the Lambda Calculus back from 1940. So remember, I mean, this is all prior to anybody building any computers. Um, and, uh, and here's a, a, a presentation of, uh, of Church's um, simple typed lambda calculus in modern programming language notation. So um, this is very much the heart of programming language research. If you go to a programming language conference like ICFP or Popple, then pretty much every paper has a figure that looks a bit like this in it somewhere. Uh, most things that people do involve adding various sorts of fancy bells and whistles to this system that Church came up with in, in, in 1940. And here's a, a typical functional programmer getting excited about the type lambda calculus. So, um, so as I say, this uses Frege's, the presentation of the system uses Frege's uh, notation for, um, for derivations. 
And the form is that you have a collection, an environment, a context, which tells you what type um, uh, the variables have. And under such a context, you can deduce that some expression has some type. So if in your collection of assumptions, you have that the variable x has type A, you can deduce that the variable x has type A. Which is not terribly exciting. But more exciting here is that this, the, the way this is read is, if under some assumptions, M has type A, R, O, B, so this is M is a function which takes A's as inputs and produces B's as outputs. And under the same set of assumptions, N is something of type A, the input type, then what you get by applying the function M to the argument N is something of type B. Similarly, if under some number of assumptions plus the extra assumption that X has type A, you can deduce that M has type B, then just under the assumptions gamma, you can deduce that the function lambda x dot m, the function that takes x as input and gives you back m, is a function from a's to b's. And there are also constructions of pairs and disjoint unions. So if you have an a and a b, you can pair them together to get something of type a cross b. And if you have something of type a cross b, then you can project out the first component of it and get back something of type a. And, uh, and similar rules for uh, for disjoint unions, which include the Booleans. So, um, so Church had intended his lambda calculus to be the basis for a logic, but um, in fact, there's a deeper connection between his typed lambda calculus and logic than he realised. So, to see that, we have to go to a different presentation of logic, which is due to this chap, Gerhard Gensen. And in 1935, he uh, introduced a presentation of logic called natural deduction. So he didn't like the way that Frege and Hilbert had set up their formal systems, the way that they mixed up all the connectives in their descriptions of what the, what the rules of the system were. And he, uh, he introduced this, um, this way of presenting logic uh, in which each logical connective came with rules which explained how you introduced it, how, uh, how, uh, how you deduced something that contained that logical connective, and how you eliminated it, how if you got one of those things, you could get rid of it. So here's his presentation of, of logic. So the way he writes it is that there's a bunch of assumptions up on the top, and a proof is a sequence of steps that allow you to deduce some conclusion. So here's modus ponens again. This is the one we saw in, 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 uh, in, in, Fre in Frege's um, uh, work. So here this says if you've deduced A implies B, and you've deduced A, you can conclude B. And here this notation here is, corresponds to the idea that if you deduced B from an assumption A, the assumptions are all kind of floating at the top, then you can conclude A implies B and strike out that assumption. Right? <coughs> so similarly here, if you have proved A and you've proved B, then you can conclude A and B, and so on. So this system is very pretty, has lots of nice symmetries. And the other thing that Genson introduced was the notion that proofs themselves had a, had a dynamics. They had a uh, they, they were subject to equations. So the idea was that if you had two proofs of the, of the same fact, but one of them was like the other one, but just had some silly detours in it, then you could remove the detours and it was kind of the same proof. So here's an example of, of that. So here I've got a proof of A implies B, um, and I've got a proof of A and a deduction of B using modus ponens. So here I introduced implication, and here I immediately eliminated it. Well, the proof of A implies B had an assumption of A before, before. So I can take this proof that gives me an A, and now this proof was assuming an A, and I can plug that proof on top, and I get this simpler proof that just has B at the bottom, and the A has, is, is somewhere in the middle, so the assumptions here, or whatever the assumptions were, um, up here. So he had this notion of proof simplification. Now if you take Genson's system, and you change the notation a little bit, so you turn it sideways, so this is using the, uh, um, uh, keeping the assumptions that Genson kept dangling freely at the top, you're writing them all down using gamma, the same letter as I used before, then this is what Genson's rules look like. So here we have that you have proved A implies B, you've proved A, you can conclude B, and here you've proved B on an assumption of A, and you've deduced A implies B without the assumption of A, and so on. So you just take Genson's rules and turn them sideways and keep track of the, uh, of the assumptions at every step. 
But then you change your notation a little bit. So the s symbols we write for implication and conjunction and so forth are completely arbitrary. So instead of writing the implication symbol, I'll write this arrow. And instead of writing a logical conjunction, I'll write this cross. I end up with something that's starting to look very familiar. So the final step is to say, well, we're taking these proofs seriously. So what we would like is not just to have a derivation that something is true, but to pair together the fact that it's true with a record of what the derivation was. So all we have to do to do that is for each one of these logical inference rules, we have to have something that records what logical rule we used at each step. So that now the big tree of derivations with all the, with, that, that has kind of axioms at the top and the conclusion at the bottom will be encoded in some expression. So all we need to do is come up with a new expre an expression for each one of these rules. And then by combining those up, we'll, we'll keep a record of what the proof was. So again, exactly what syntax we choose for that doesn't matter. But it turns out there's a syntax which works rather nicely, which is precisely the syntax of Church's lambda calculus. So, um, so here we had a proof of A implies B and a proof of A. And we just have to we say, well, we'll let M be at some notation for that proof and n be some notation for that proof. And then we just say, well, this proof was obtained by applying this rule to these two subproofs, m and n. So we need some, something which has an m in it and an n in it. And we'll choose to write m applied to n for that, for that proof. And similarly here for lambda abstraction and so forth. So if you take Church's type lambda calculus and Genson's natural deduction um, are exactly the same system. And in fact, Genson's notion of proof simplification, those eliminations of detours in proofs that he introduced, correspond exactly to the beta reduction redu rules of the lambda calculus, which we would think of as describing how a functional program executes, how, how functions are applied to, to their arguments. So we get this correspondence between proofs in constructive logic and notions that we're familiar with from programming languages. It's called the Curry-Howard isomorphism after Haskell Curry, who was the first person to notice this and after whom obviously the Haskell programming language is, uh, is named. Um, and, uh, and the correspondence goes like this. So propositions in the logic behave like, type, behave like types um, for terms. Proofs in the logic correspond to programs. So a program, um, uh, a program has a type is the same thing as saying that a proof proves a proposition. The logical operation of conjunction behaves exactly like the programming language notion of pairing. The logical notion of disjunction corresponds to disjoint union types in programming languages, which C programmers would think of as a kind of a spe special use of, um, of union types. Impl most importantly, implication in the logic corresponds to forming a function space in the programming language. And the process of proof normalization behaves very much like the operational semantics, the step-by-step -step reduction rules of the programming language. So this propositions as types analogy is one of the greatest ideas in programming language theory. It's proved incredibly fruitful, and it extends to lots and lots of systems that are more complicated than the simple type system that, um, that I just showed you. And if you look through the history of the subject, you discover amazingly frequently you get exactly the same idea invented twice, once by a logician and once by a computer scientist. And a particularly uh, a good example of that is the, uh, the second order lambda calculus. So these two chaps are Jean-Yves Girard, who's a French logician, very famous as the inventor of linear logic, um, and John Reynolds, who's a computer scientist uh, from Carnegie Mellon University, who sadly died recently. And they simultaneously invented the same system. So Girard was interested in the theory of proofs and complexity analysis. And he invented what's called system F, or impredictive second order propositional intuitionistic logic. And Reynolds was interested in programming languages and uh, being able to write programs that were typed but had more generic types, what we would now call polymorphic types, uh, than before, and he invented the polymorphic lambda calculus. So Girard invented system F in 71, and um, independently Reynolds invented the polymorphic lambda calculus in 74, and they're exactly the same system. And those are the foundations for uh, parametric polymorphism in Haskell, or generics in C sharp, and so on. In fact, all modern programming languages um, really have, have polymorphic functions these days. And this calculus is very expressive. You can encode 
inductive data types of the sort that most programming languages give you as a new notion, just using polymorphic functions. Um, and the correspondence between logical notions and um, computational notions has been really kind of well studied in this context. And one of the, one of the nicest things that came out of that and, is that the discovery by John Mitchell and Gordon Plotkin that second order, second order existential quantification, which is actually encodable in, the, in, in system F, um, in the logic, corresponds exactly to the notion of abstract data type in, uh, in programming languages. So this use of, 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 of fancier type languages starts to lead you, and, and the propositions as types analogy, starts to lead you to think of types as like specifications for programs. So a program having a type is like a program uh, meeting a specification. And um, other people not working on lambda calculus-based languages had also done great work on logics for proving that programs meet their specifications. So I guess most people have seen this logic, which is due to Tony Hoare, who works in our group now. Um, so this is a logic for proving properties of simple imperative programs. And the, the shape of it is that you, uh, you prove that uh, a program has uh, a pr uh, satisfies what's called a Hoare triple. So this says, if you start the program in a state satisfying A, where A is some predicate, some assertion about the state, um, uh, then the program will, if it terminates, land up in a state that satisfies what's called the post condition. So this says the skip program does nothing. So this says for any A, um, if, the, if the state beforehand satisfies A and you execute skip, which does nothing, then the state afterwards will satisfy A, which is kind of obvious. And then there are rules for each one of the constructs of the simple imperative programming language. So um, if, uh, if C1 takes state satisfying A to state satisfying A primed, and C2 takes any state satisfying A primed to something satisfying A double primed, then if you start the sequential composition C1 then C2 um, in a state satisfying A, you will end up in a state satisfying A double primed. So, so we have logics for reasoning about programs like this, and we have, we have, we have type systems for, uh, for functional programs, which uh, can be read as, as specifications in a very similar way. Now, about the time when Tony came up with this, which 1969 or so, the status in both mathematics and, um, or well, shortly afterwards, in mathematics and computer science was kind of similar. We had, we had nice stories, nice formal stories, about what the work of practicing mathematicians really meant. And there was a, so the story was, well, whatever you do can be translated into one of these formal systems. Um, so in theory, when you write something in your mathematics journal paper, um, it's shorthand for a statement in one of these formal languages, probably um, zamelo frankel set theory with the axiom of choice. Um, but nobody actually would ever do that. It was clearly completely impractical to ever prove anything you cared about in one of these formal systems. And people would point to ridiculous things like Principia Math Math Mathematica as examples of how, how ludicrous that was. And there were many papers published, um, in fact, still, some people do publish papers which say how crazy the idea of formalizing mathematics in a formal system is as a way of actually getting any maths done. And exactly the same situation pertains in the world of uh, software verification. So we had systems like this, we had, types, we, we had types which weren't terribly expressive, but then we had program logics like this which could prove interesting properties of programs, but it was clearly impractical to ever prove any property of any program you ever cared about. So the sort of formal logicist dream was, uh, was very much idealized compared to the real world in terms of the work of practicing mathematicians or practicing software engineers. But these things, these things can change quite rapidly. And of course, the thing that makes them change in both cases is the fact that these formal systems are very much amenable to being manipulated on a computer. So these two chaps are Thierry Cocon and uh, Gerard Hewitt. And they came up in the late 80s, or mid, mid to late 80s, with the calculus of inductive constructions. So this is a lambda calculus, very much like the type lambda calculus that I showed you earlier, uh, but it's a bit more powerful. So it has a single syntactic structure in which types and terms live. And its types uh, feature something called dependency. De it's a dependently typed language. And what that means is that the types can mention terms. So what that gives you is something which is very much like Church's type lambda calculus, except it has a lot more power, even though 
as a formal set of rules, it's not terribly much more complicated. So now the types can express fairly arbitrary specifications of your programs. So you can write down a type, which is the type of functions which compute the factorial, or, um, or functions which um, uh, compute the length of lists or whatever. So those sorts of things can now be expressed in the type language, the sorts of things that are in the logic due to Tony for, for reasoning about um, imperative programs. But now we're talking about much fancier, higher typed objects. We're talking about functions, functions on functions, rather than just flat store the way that Tony was. So this remarkable, remarkably simple set of rules gives you a very powerful uh, logic. And it can also, the courtesy of the propositions of types analogy, be seen as a programming language with a very powerful type system. And this has been implemented in a system called COC, which is a computer implementation of the calculus of inductive constructions, which can be seen simultaneously as a very, a very fancily typed pure functional programming language, or a computer program in which you can interactively do almost arbitrary mathematics. And because of the way that the logic works and the way that the system is implemented, you can build up remarkably complicated bits of code or remarkably complicated mathematical theorems using the power of abstraction, which kind of gives you a multiplying factor each time you apply it, such that it is actually feasible to prove non-trivial mathematical results and have everything at the end of the day expand out to a statement in this very simple formal language. So these systems have become usable over just the last five or six years and there's been an explosion of work in using them to produce completely formally verified proofs of very non-trivial bits of mathematics and to prove non-trivial pieces of software. So looking at mathematics first, the guy on the left here is Georges Gontier, another person who works in our group. Um, and in 2005 he used Koch to produce a completely formally verified proof of the four color theorem, a theorem I guess everyone's heard of that you can color any planar map uh, using at most four colors where the rule is that adjacent regions mustn't, uh, mustn't be colored with the same co color. And this is, you know, this is a problem which goes back um, uh, uh, many, many years. It was proved in 1976 by Appel and Harkin. They did a paper proof which used a computer uh, to check a whole bunch of special cases that arose in the proof. It was custom computer code. Um, and you had to kind of read the paper proof to understand even what the computer code was supposed to do. Um, and this sparked, this, this, this proof of a, of a long-standing open problem sparked a lot of debate about the role of computers uh, in proof. And the proof that Georges came up with in 2005 is, is, is of a quite different character. He didn't just write a computer program to help him with his calculations. He used a computer to verify the actual proof right down to the last detail. So there's a statement of the theorem is completely comprehensible. And if you believe that the logic that's implemented in Koch is consistent, then you pretty much have to believe um, that the proof is correct. So the computer's checked every last detail. So the computer doesn't do the proof for you. You have to interactively construct the proof with the help of the computer, but the computer will check that you haven't forgotten everything and that every step you applied was valid. Uh, this chap's Tom Hales. So he, he had a proof in uh, whenever it was. Um, I forget. So, so a, a few years ago, Tom, Tom Hales proved out a very long-standing uh, uh, open problem. So this is the Kepler conjecture which, as you can guess from the name, is quite old, 1611, I think. Um, and this was that uh, if you're trying to stack spheres, then the densest way that you can possibly pa pack spheres is um, hexagonal close packing or cubic close packing, this kind of pyramid shape. And this is sort of intuitively uh, obvious and well known to anyone who's ever kind of put cannonballs on, the, on, on their ship or, or grapefruit on their grocery store. Um, but proving that that was their densest possible arrangement of spheres is incredibly difficult. And, uh, and Tom Hales had a similar experience to Appel and Harkin. He, he, he did a proof of this, which was a complete breakthrough, but he used a computer program to, um, uh, to check a whole bunch of special cases. And, uh, and the journal he submitted it to said, well, we're not quite sure about this, and sent it off to a bunch of referees who took, I think, four years to study the proof. And they finally came back and said, well, we're 99% certain it's right, but we're not quite sure about this, this computer stuff. Um, so Tom said, right, in that case, I'm going to really prove it on a computer and check every last detail. And so he's had a long-running project going called FlySpec, um, which is 
formal proof of Kepler um, to, to produce a complete formal verification of the proof of, uh, of the Kepler conjecture. And that's kind of ongoing, but, uh, but, uh, but looks like it's going to work. And then just last year, after having proved the full colour theorem in 2005, Georges announced the formal proof of a, a, a substantially more uh, impressive piece of mathematics, the fight thompson theorem. So um, this is, a, this is a, a graph of the dependency uh, uh, between the different modules of the Koch proof that Georges did of the, uh, the fight thompson theorem. This is a proof in, in finite group theory, um, also known as the odd order theorem. It says that every, um, uh, every group, finite group of, of odd order is, uh, is soluble. So uh, uh, this also says that every uh, odd order simple group must be uh, must be the integers modulo p for some for some p. And this was this when this was published on paper was a a kind of shocking proof. It was a it was a proof that was 255 pages long. It's now published in in two books. And uh, and George has formalised every last detail of that proof, which is a, a truly outstanding uh, achievement. And the th one of the things the secret source that George uses when he does these proofs. Um, uh, one, of, one, of, one of them is that he uses the fact that this system is both a system for computation and a system for deduction. So, so you can write deductive proofs in Koch where you just say, well, this is true because this and this, and therefore because of that, this is true. But Koch can also do computation. And that, if you use that intelligently, that can greatly reduce the size of the proof and the amount of manual interaction that you, you have to do. So you could prove you know, that 2 plus 2 equals 4 by applying Piano's axioms for, to, for, for arithmetic and you would have a proof that 2 plus 2 equals 4 which would be a derivation in the logic but Koch can compute so if you ask Koch to prove that 2 plus 2 equals 4 it says well they're the same thing so the, because it knows that two, 2 plus 2 reduces it has computation built in as well as deduction and a, intelligent use of that is the, uh, is the thing that makes, uh, makes these proofs of substantial bits of mathematics possible. So there's also been an explosion in the use of formal systems like Koch in programming language research just over the last five or six years. So there are a couple of big landmark things that everyone refers to. So one of them is a verification of um, an operating system kernel called SEL4 um, by a group at NICTA in Australia. So they have a, they have a proof that a, a bunch of C code meets, its, uh, meets a, a specification. And there's a formally verified compiler for a, a, a C-like language that was done by Xavier Leroy at uh, INRIA using the Koch system. And just in our group, this has been taken up just in the last five or six years. So we have, I don't know, 35, 40 projects now um, that have used Koch to formalize some or all of the work that they were doing. And in all sorts of, in all sorts of areas, so compilers, um, domain theory, which is kind of the mathematics behind modeling programming languages, the dimension types that are in F sharp have been formalized in Koch, uh, proofs of the uh, computational, uh, of the, the security of, of crypto primitives, uh, right down to the, the computational definitions of security uh, being carried out in Koch here. Formalization of advanced module systems, the meaning of refinement type systems, languages like F star, a whole bunch of programming logics for reasoning about uh, programs with pointers, separation logics have been formalized in Koch here, and the foundations of termination analysis, the stuff that Byron was talking about before, have been formalized in Koch. And I'll just show you one of the, uh, one of the projects that I've been involved with recently. So, so this, 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 I like this because it kind of ex it's a good example of what I was saying about this being a cock being a system in which you can do mathematics and you can do programming and you can relate the two. So, so here, what we've done is we've built a formal model in cock of the x86 processor. So we define what the, what the processor architecture is. We tell the system it has these registers and so forth um, and these instructions and this is how instructions are encoded in memory. Um, and then we express the semantics of the processor, how the processor steps from one step to the next. Um, so this is, the, this is a, bu a bunch of stuff that you can't read that tells you how a multiplication instruction uh, is executed in the processor. And then on top of that, also inside the system, we can define an assembly language and we can explain how the assembly language programs are mapped down to sequences of bytes. And that function from assembly language programs to sequences of bytes is a function that we can actually execute inside Koch, so we can write assembly language programs in Koch, compute them in Koch to get a sequence of bytes which we can extract from Koch, burn onto a CD and boot a machine from. But then at the same time, we can use Koch to define a programming, uh, a programming logic 
a, a system for reasoning about properties of these assembly language programs. So the, the logic is defined in the system and the meaning of assertions in the logic in terms of the behavior of the machine model that we formalized in COC is all defined. So the soundness of the logic, the fact that the thing, when you prove something about an assembly language program, it's a true statement about how that will execute on the processor is proved in COC. And then we can then in COC have COC check the proofs of particular programs that we have written in the embedded assembly language. So uh, we get the highest possible confidence that the code that we write really satisfies the specification when it's run on the machine. There's no external dependencies other than COC. So provided that our model of x86 is correct, we have the highest assurance we could possibly have that the code um, will behave itself. And you'll see we've got the architecture, the semantics, the binary, the co this compiler, the language, the specifications, the logic, and the proof of a program, and they all live in one system, and they can all be related. So we're mixing computation and deduction in a, in a, in a, very, uh, a very tight way. So I'll stop there. Um, the conclusion is we're making significant progress in the last few years towards realizing the dreams of Leibniz, Frege, and Russell to have fully formalized mathematics, and of Hoare, Scott, and others to have formally specified and verified computer software. And at the same time, we're getting powerful and expressive programming languages. And I will leave you with last week's New Scientist, which had an article on mechanized proofing, and their caption is, machine-minded mathematicians will rule the future. So I'll stop there.